My argument is that South Africa's experience of democratic constitutionalism and the rule of law, and indeed of rights talk, over the last 18 years since the end of apartheid, powerfully instances what can rightfully be achieved with rights. Constitutionalism in my country has not been a panacea, nor has the jurisprudence giving effect to it been flawless, but it has secured some signal achievements, and these should be celebrated. To do this, in the next part of the lecture, I look at three aspects of our constitutional achievements over the past 18 years. I look at the role of legal rights in securing the material conditions of life. I look as, at law as a corrective of public irrationality. And lastly, I look as law, at law as a determinant of civic dignity and moral citizenship. After considering these achievements, I reflect on what law and constitutionalism cannot do. But I conclude by returning to a modest reassertion of the importance of rights. First then, bricks and mortar, legal rights and the material conditions of life. The first democratic elections in South Africa were in April 1994. They took place under an interim constitution negotiated principally between the outgoing apartheid government and the African National Conference, Congress. South Africa's first parliament, functioning as a, as a constitutional convention, then determined the final constitution, which was subject to review by the Constitutional Court, which had to certify the content of the constitution against previously agreed constitutional principles. Unlike the interim constitution, the final constitution contained rights to social and economic goods, rightly called subsistence rights. Apart from the right to basic education and the provision that no one may be refused emergency medical treatment, these entitlements are not absolute or immediate. They are impressed as rights to have access to social and economic goods. These include adequate housing, health care services, sufficient food and water, social security, and basic, uh, beyond basic education, further education. Given the intricate qualifications surrounding social and e economic rights and the high hopes pinned on the transition to democracy after apartheid, the first rulings of the Constitutional Court on these rights were, were awaited with very considerable expectation. And the first two judgments of the Court proved very controversial. The first was in November 1997, just a few months after the Constitution came into effect. The judgment denied a dying man access to kidney dialysis. He died soon after. The decision attracted extensive criticism, but the ruling was correct. The challenged health policy limited dialysis to patients with acute renal failure who could be successfully treated. The claimant's condition was irreversible. He was in the final stages of chronic renal failure. Dialysis would prolong his life, but giving it to him would deny it to others who had a better chance of survival. Though agonizing, the court could not have told the health care administrators that their policy was wrong. The second decision pro proved not much less controversial. Mrs. Irene Grootboom was one of a group of desperately poor people who moved onto private land to erect informal homes or shacks. But the land had already been set aside for formal low-cost housing, so the government moved them out. It was the middle of an exceptionally wet and cold winter, and they had nowhere to go. The emergency accommodation was not provided. In a unanimous judgment, the court refused to grant Mrs. Krutboom an order that, go that government should give her a house. Instead, it declared government's policy generally unlawful for failing to provide for people in her condition. Hence, the court only granted an, a general order that declared that government's housing programs were obliged to provide for people in her position, namely for those who have no access to land, no roof over their heads, and who are living in intolerable or crisis conditions. It declared government's policy invalid to the extent that it failed to do this. Mrs. Hrutboom died in August 2008. 
eight years after this judgment, she was still living in a shack. It has become a commonplace taunt directed at the Constitutional Court that she died without a home. The litigation had failed to secure her house. And the taunt is well directed. It is a humbling reminder to those of us who are in the business of law and constitutionalism that our craft has limits. But the judgment did not achieve nothing. On the contrary, it is now recognized as providing a productive seedbed for the court's socio-economic jurisprudence. It is conceded that it has multiple indirect material and symbolically, symbolic effects. This has rightly received international recognition. But it has achieved far more than indirect, symbolic and indirect benefits. The decision has had a direct material impact on many people's lives, perhaps many millions of lives. The nub of the judgment was, requ was to require the state to take ac active steps to create access to social services and economic resources for the most vulnerable in South Africa. To this injunction, government proved responsive. It enacted Chapter 12 of the National Housing Code. This is an obligatory guide that requires national, provincial and municipal government to plan and act where people are in desperate need. The code itself calls the judgment in Mrs. Kruitboom's case a landmark judgment. And it puts on record that a year after the judgment, the decision impelled national and provincial ministers responsible for housing to authorize a national program for quick action to relieve the plight of persons in emergency situations. The clear implication is that without Mrs. Kruitboom's rights-directed litigation and without the court's declaratory order, the country's housing program would have continued to omit provision for the emergency needs of the poorest and the most desperate. More direct executive impact and outcome are difficult to instance. Eleven years later, the practical implications of Kruitboom continue to grow. The court of which I am now a part has recently held that the same housing code requires local government to make emergency provision not only for people whom it itself evicts, as was the case with Mrs. Kruitboom, but to make the same provision for those who are evicted at the instance of private landowners. This decision will have a very significant impact on the allocation of resources by urban municipalities. The court's socio-economic jurisprudence is far from perfect. Commentators have criticized its basic approach, which flinches from specifying that each of the social rights has a claimable minimum content. Critics have also bitterly denounced the court for refusing some claimants' relief and for its reasons when doing so. From other commentators, the court's jurisprudence has elicited praise. The debate does not require resolution here. My thesis is much more modest. It is only that Kruitboom and its progeny are a telling example of how rights-directed litigation can improve the conditions of a considerable group of socially vulnerable people in ways that would not have occurred without rights. These decisions show how rights claims can be practically translated into material improvements in the lives of the poorest. Mrs. Kruitboom's death without a house does not mean that we should give up on legal rights. It means only that we should do better.